So we just meditate and uh, as a practice in this communion, if we have our heart attention and if we can abide in the present breath, then that's why we just practiced. So the end game of the practice is no practice. That 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 consciousness that has no content, that place that we talked about last night, that's conjoined. So what is meditation? In the chapter in the teaching book that I call um, to know no mind, to know no mind, which outrages mind, normative mind which also outrages conventional consciousness. Because how can you know no mind? That's that understanding of emptiness. If you understand it as, I call it fasting mind, I said the feasting heart that finds the pilgrimage of the fasting mind, that conjoined state of energy and consciousness without separation, the conjoined state of the conjugal vows between awakeness and love and then the conjoined union of the corporeal and the incorporeal this body and what we call the incorporeal knowing that the incorporeal is incorporeal so when I was talking about Advaita and that state of non-duality to reach that place and I remember I said we are the instrument of our practice it's a very uh, deep journey. It seems heretical to mind because mind cannot discern the consciousness that I'm speaking of. What it took me 10 years to understand, perhaps longer, in very, very deep meditation, is that you, if you speak it, it's silenced. In spontaneous become silence. If it's named, it's silenced. If you try to um, apprehend it, then it's in its nakedness, it's immediately unveiled. Even in its nakedness, if we disrobe it, it's unveiled. So that the, the understanding of hearing and deeper listening, the understanding of seeing and watching. So it begins with the transformation, which is a radical transformation, from seeing to watching, to holding mind as object, as opposed to mind as subject. Already this can be difficult to understand, in mind. What the revelation for me was, later I can talk about revelation as revelation, is the way we can understand meditation is by meditating. So a Dharma talk is only the invitation to come. Say come, come, come again, if that's a Sufi understanding, as an invitation. But each mystical tradition has its invitation. The gift is already required always before it's gifted. So even in the come, come again, it's there's something that's seeded. A seed has been planted. But it can be no one, only in the meditation. So we can we can and we talked about this last night. The, the technocracy. It's not available in that technology that is causing a greater conflagration. This is available in this technology of the heart awakening, the mind awakening to itself. So we can say, what is the content of love? Does love have content? What is the consciousness, the caveat of that consciousness? What is that content? So it's, a, it's the numinous of non-separation itself. The, when we are, are trying to enunciate this in mind and to articulate, articulate it through the construct of the cognitive, it's being received through the cognitive, through that mechanism, through that aperture, that anthropomorphic aperture that is human. So if it's, if it's constructed in the in, in cognitive, then you, you, can, you, you can deconstruct it, you can try to outrage the ideation through a cone, for example, because we can't understand the cone. The 
brings us to, to uh, a, a darshan. Because we can, the, what, I, what I call the, the witness of energy, or the energy witness. So we can, we can understand it through the energy itself. And in that energy, consciousness is gifted. But to try to say, what is meditation? There's many descriptives of what it can, and there's many, many, many schools of meditation. And that can become uh, an, exege an exegetical exercise. It can become discursive. It can become even a dialectic. But to taste the experience, that transformation from the knowledge of experience to the experience of knowledge, even the ecstatic understanding, to the understanding of the ecstatic, and then it no longer is an ecstatic experience. So we, we can understand meditation when we understand that we are the instrument of our practice. As in, uh, as in to recapit recapitulate from, uh, from last night, you can't, you can't uh, imagine uh, a great musician who doesn't practice. That's the volition of, him, of, the, of that that journey and through the volition what we're seeking is non-volition effortlessness born of non-effort so we want to hold mind as object and in deeper meditation which is far more rare is to hold consciousness as object that's difficult to find even a nomenclature for there's no hermeneutics for it there's no algorithm for it there's no logarithm for it there's no pure science. Uh, there's no empiricism for it. There, need, there doesn't need to be empiricism. The empiricism is the experience itself. It's the pure experience itself. And every mystic understands that. It's a mystical understanding. And even that will confuse the mind. Because when we hear mystic, we hear there is no interlocutor. There is this, there is that. Um, immediately, there's a language arising to try to interpret what cannot be interpreted in mind because we're talking about consciousness. So you can't think love. We don't think love. We don't think freedom. Yet we have an alien of freedom. So what is meditation? Meditation allows the radical transformation from the normative state of the constructed nature to all the habituated realities and that anthropomorphic aperture that is human all to you to be able to be transformed transcended as above so below so that we have this this beautiful pilgrimage I say in the book where any two strangers meet but this beautiful pilgrimage where the mind is no longer in diaspora from heart mind is no longer in diaspora from heart the lotus of the heart is now the locus of mind this is entirely possible to know, and is what we're seeking. So when I, I can ask you again, what is it that we're seeking? What is it that human beings are seeking? Peace. That's it. So if we're seeking peace, how can we find peace that is an ever-present peace? That, that uh, be beautiful parable and adage that peace that transcends all knowledge, a peace that, lead, that is gifted in the abode of the sanctuary, that refuge that allows us to be present in this moment between us. It's a beautiful, we had beautiful moments last night, which is this moment. It's a great gift to be speaking with you last night. It's a blessedness. We're, we say the word blessed because there's a holiness. So the profane and the sacred are no longer in disunity. We find a, a pureness that is uh, the, 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 the real understanding of yoga. So I, I, I wrote four, there are actually five, the last one is more of an adjunct, pillar, pillars of the understanding of non-separation. Buddha, so a Buddha would be awake at this. These are literal translations. So we have Buddha, and then yoga, union, pure union. 
and then we, we can say uh, in Sufism or Islam that we have to be prostrate to surrender and then Christ, consciousness, love and then we could look at uh, the Hebraic tradition, Judaism as justice you can, you can read that in any you can just you can take one of those uh, qualities, not descriptions, and not descriptions, not down on the nature. It's the consciousness, love, awakeness, surrender, union, and you can move them in any direction and speak it backwards, forwards. It becomes a shibboleth, but it's pure shibboleth of true understanding that allows us not to be endangered by mind not to be in that vast empire of thought where one rogue thought can lead us forever astray in our wanting states, in, in the nature, the indentured nature of mind, which is that ellipsis, that eternal ellipsis of thought, that thought that is the hill that obscures the mountain, that obscures the hill, that which is every thought, except for discerning thought. So what it is that mindfulness, what I call to be in but not of mind, is, is a critical acumen for discernment itself. We have to navigate the world, the universe. And so we need, we need to have that mindfulness. But that's, that's not the same thing as a, the normative state of what we understand mind to be, just simply to see. Now we're watching we're watching what we're seeing. So we're watching our thoughts without volition. And that's what meditation can allow you to do through breath practice. There are many paths. For meditation, it's a very, very powerful understanding and a true understanding and a true practice. But it, it, the word fidelity is, is so important. We talked about that as well because it's a daily practice. And when we find the fidelity as we would with a lover, and something is, is birth, an immaculate birth. Not the, myth, the mythos, but truly an immaculate birth in one breath, to be awakened in each breath. It is possible to be awake to our lower states, even in, our, in, in, in a moment that we perhaps in, are not in our ascended self or in our, in our best self, we're watching. So we can honor another by honoring ourselves love another by first loving ourselves. We can heal another by first healing ourselves. But this takes effort. Through the effort, effortlessness is born. And that means that through the volition, there is no longer any volition. It's also true in the martial arts that in your practice of martial arts, you're not thinking the movement. Alex would, would have said, what, I think it was five or six years ago, in martial arts you need a feeling state. That's true in martial arts. We're not looking for a feeling state in meditation. We're looking for the knowing state. And this confuses the mind. It can sound like an arrogated position. And it isn't. In meditation, what happens is the unknown disappears because the, the, the proverbial understanding is the seeker becoming sought. That took many, many years to understand because it cannot be understood in mind, but now they can love. How do we know love? If if I, if you receive love, if I love you, you'll feel, you'll taste, you'll know love through the sacrificial nature of love, through the requited nature of love, that we can find this union, this communion. So there's a a, a departure that uh, though we we could see it as a preemptive practice suffering because we can't speak of meditation without an understanding that suffering is a gift that's a, an heretical understanding in mind how could suffering be a gift and this brings us to what, what I the impermanence and permanence I call it changelessness in change in youth we seek to understand the change as changelessness the changeless as we grow older in the, the normative mind, in the normative journey. Uh, human beings try to understand later what is changeless in that change. In the, the nostalgia itself, 
is an illusion because we, we what we have what has been bereft that that um, barren womb of meaning that we're in the existential understanding it's barren because it hasn't yet been gifted the awakeness of what consciousness can give to all of us. Now there is an ordinary occasion of grace. We all have moments of consciousness. Lovers, if you're, if you're, if it's, if you're gifted and you're privileged to have that embrace in true loverhood, we're able to have a divine glance. We're able to have it in nature, human nature, in communion with nature. Meditation is trying to awaken us through not attaching to the sensorium to be able to see through the veils because it's the wanting states it's the mind and it's the flesh the distracted states that we have to it's not that we eradicate them it's that they they dissipate but some some will say you annihilate some will say you eradicate this term that there are many many myriads of terms but something radical is transformed and it's through the process of the meditation so the way to understand meditation is to practice the meditation as you would any instrument which in this case is the instrument of self that's a brief understanding of what it can be that's great um so speaking of which um how would you describe or what would you say is consciousness? Whatever I say consciousness is, what will be received is, uh, is first translated through the, uh, the state of ideation that receives it. So that if, if, I, was to give, if I was to give you a definition consciousness uh, it's if we go back to meditation and we say it's the fasting mind and we understand that as emptying ourselves of something what are we emptying ourselves of we're emptying ourselves of identified states self identification it's not an easy task that's why there's Dharma that's why there's so many different paths in life and that's why we can say all things are perfect as it is in an imperfect world, but we need yet to repair the world. And I could spend two hours talking about paradigms of that in each mystical tradition. In order to eradicate the self-identification, we have to sever the Gordian knot in 